Good morning. God bless you. Welcome to church this morning. Welcome to Dade City First United Methodist Church. I'm Robert Roseberry, pastor at this community of faith. Hope everyone had a wonderful holiday week celebrating the birth of our country. And uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, If this is your first time here with us this morning, we do have a guest information card located in your weekly update that you got when you came in. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better, so we'd appreciate you filling that out. And you can put that card in the offering plate when you're done. On the back of that card is a form to submit a prayer request. If anyone has a prayer request or a praise for us to all pray about over the coming weeks. And uh, there is news in your weekly update, so I will point you to that for news and announcements. And the uh, first thing is that the uh, Fellowship Wednesday meal is back. We'd love for you to come. We've been skipping kind of alternating weeks on our Wednesday night dinners, but we are going to have our fellowship meal uh, this next Wednesday, and we'd love for you to come and be a part of it. So please sign up when the sign-up sheet gets to you. Our first hymn is hymn number 100 in your hymnals. Would you please stand in body or in spirit? We're going to sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. So we're skipping verse 3 of God's God whose love is reigning over us. be seated. All right, I think the sign-up sheets are going around for Wednesday night dinner, so thank you, Heather, for bringing those in. And she brought the offering plates, so we can have an offering today, which is kind of nice. It's just one of those days. All right, coming into our prayer time for this week, uh, prayers for everyone still traveling over the Independence Day holiday this week, and also pray for those who have been or will be in the path of Hurricane Barrel. Uh, this past week and in the coming few days, as well as survivors of uh, recent storms around the country. And there are wildfires in California, so we do need some prayers uh, for lots of things in our world this morning. Let us hear from Psalm 148 as we prepare our hearts for prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him from the skies. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all the armies of heaven. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you twinkling stars. Praise Him, skies above. Praise Him, vapors high above the clouds. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord. For He issued His command, and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. 
Praise the Lord from the earth, you creatures of the ocean depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, wind and weather that obey him, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and cedars, wild animals and livestock, small scurrying animals and birds, kings of the earth and all people, rulers and judges of the earth, young men and young women, old men and children, let them all praise the name of the Lord. For his name is very great. His glory towers over the earth and heaven. He has made his people strong, honoring his faithful ones, the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you created us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant to us such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion would hinder us from knowing your will and no weakness from doing it. In your light, may we see life clearly and in your service find perfect freedom. We pray this in the name of the Savior who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 618, 618. Let us break bread together. We'll sing verses 1 through 3. Please stand in body or in spirit as we sing together. be seated and join me in prayer for our morning offering. Uh, For everyone who might not have brought a checkbook with them, there is a QR code that you can scan on the top of your weekly update if you'd rather give electronically today. And we do welcome you uh, and your gifts here at our church. Will you join me in prayer as we prepare to give back to God our tithes, his tithes, and our offerings. Let us pray. All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. 
You gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And all that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all these, your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have, together with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Amen. Amen. Rise for our doxology as we give thanks and praise to God. Thank you. You may be seated.
good to have you back, Carolyn. <laughs> Our scripture and sermon today will be from Acts chapter 11, uh, 1 through 18. I know it probably says 21 in your bulletins. Uh, apologies for that. We're not going to go all the way to verse 21. Uh, but <laughs> this is going to require some cooperative reading, some responses from you guys. Are you ready? Even if you're not, we're going to do it. <laughs> all right, just one response. Just one. Can you give me one? All right. Can you give me one? Okay. All right. I was worried you guys were all asleep already. Okay. So as we talked about last week, this story and the story we read last week are, are connected with each other. And so, in fact, uh, Peter uh, tells his whole story all over again to the elders in Jerusalem. And so we get kind of the backstory. If you didn't read the whole backstory to what, what we preached or what you heard last week, this is kind of Acts 10 and 11 really go together. And so a little bit of backstory in case you need it so you understand. Peter has uh, gone to the home of Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion, and he has baptized him into the Christian faith. And this was a big no, no. As Ricky Ricardo would have said, he had a lot of splaining to do at this point. Because this was one of the first cross-cultural Christian uh, missions. And it was somewhat kind of not even on purpose. And so following God's leading from Cornelius and also God's leading of Peter, uh, Peter decides that it is okay to baptize a Gentile into the Christian faith. Because keep in mind... Uh, Christianity was just a sect of Judaism at this point. We were known as the way, which sounds awful Star Wars and Mandalorian, and I kind of wish we had kept it. But we became Christians, called Christians at another time, but now we're just known as the way. And so Peter comes down from Caesarea Maritima, and he goes to Jerusalem to talk to the elders, because like I said, he has some explaining to do. So this is after verse 1. I'm going to give you the cue. I'm going to go like this, and you're going to say, ooh. You ready? We'll practice it once. Ooh. That's good. You guys aren't asleep. Okay, great. Okay. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles... Had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, those were the Jewish believers, criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Yeah, that was just a bonus. Y'all did it so good the first time, I figured it. Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. And as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air, and I also heard a voice, and it said to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea, remember that's Gentile territory, sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he had said that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift 
that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Does anybody know the seven last words of a church? All right. It's, it's, in, it's in the sermon title. I don't want you to pronounce that word, but it stands for something. All right. But we've always done it like that before. That's eight, sorry. There's other ways to say this. We've never done it that way before. Those are seven. There we go. Typo. Another typo. Jeez. We've never done it that way before. The elders in Jerusalem had a picture of what Christianity should be. They were followers of the Jewish Messiah. They were all Jewish. And remember, word had probably not gotten to them about the Ethiopian eunuch yet, because where did the Ethiopian eunuch go? He went back to Ethiopia, right? So he went on his way rejoicing, and he gets to the court of, of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, and, 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 you know, all heaven breaks loose, and we praise God for that. So, but, so they don't really hear about that. Philip is still doing his thing and, and not bragging about stuff, and then all of a sudden, Peter baptizes a Gentile family and household into the Christian faith. And so he is called to the church fathers, the church council of this fledgling church who still was in Jerusalem despite all the persecution. And they say, what are you doing? What is going on? They were clutching their pearls, I guess, and trying to make sense of it all. The world was changing and they were a little concerned. That's why the seven last words of a church are what they are. And you can see it in lots of different churches. My first appointment was in uh, Gulfport, Florida, just south between St. Petersburg and um, South Pasadena, just a little, a little ways from here. And it was interesting for me as I dug into the history of that community and that church to see how things had developed over the, the hundred years or so that church had been in existence. In the 1950s through the 70s, Gulfport, along with a lot of that area of Florida, grew with white middle-class post-war families who came in and, and they could buy a house cheap and they were building them like hotcakes. Well, you don't build hotcakes, but you know what I'm saying. They were... They were going like crazy. All of the, these subdivision and tracks were opening up down Central Boulevard in St. Pete, and Gulfport was a part of that expansion. But by the 1980s and into the early and mid-90s, all of those kids grew up, left the house, and the families retired and moved off to other places. And they left behind these little tiny beach bungalows that were a part of that area. People, before the big boom in the 50s, people would go down there, have a little beach house, rent it for a couple of weeks, and then go back home up north. And so then the area became kind of an inner city area. Gulfport connects with Child's Park, which is a wonderful neighborhood in St. Petersburg. And across 49th Street, that, that area became a very a kind of an inner city, you know, the typical inner city of the 90s and early 2000s. Poverty and crime became endemic. And then sometime in the 90s through to the day that I served there, I got there in 2007 and served there until 2010, there was this gradual gentrification happening, led by kind of a, a little more bohemian and artsy crowd. The quaint little fishing village that, had, that Gulfport had started out as was becoming a place filled with hippies, artists. There was an actual hippie commune there, I kid you not. Hippies, artists, small little beach bungalows that were now being revived again, and the residents proudly called it North Key West. 
It was like a small Austin, Texas or Key West. It was an interesting place. Whenever I would talk to people about our church and, and I would walk the dog around and, and try to you know, talk to folks, get to know the community, I would tell them I was the new pastor at First United Methodist Church and they would look at me kind of funny. And I learned that I needed to refer to my church as the church by the dog park for them to know what it was. And then I began, because I began to see all of these folks walking their dogs by our church, but they never stopped to look. They were just, you know, making sure their dog pooped in the right place or something. And they would just walk into the dog park. We were about half a block away from the dog park. And so I began to talk to them. And I, and I even one time in a little bit of a cheeky mood, pitched to church council that we needed to change our church sign. First United Methodist was a little awkward to say we just needed to be the church by the dog park because that's what the town knew us as. And it was in a beautiful downtown area. We had a park right across the street and our, our old sanctuary was now the, the Gulfport History Historical Museum. It was a very cute little wood church there that somehow had survived years of hurricanes and floods. And um, it was a beautiful little area that the church was located in. But the town and the church had never really connected on a meaningful level. As the community around them changed and got weirder and weirder to them, to the church folks, instead of reaching out and expanding their view of what church could be, they circled around each other. And this church loved each other. They were great at loving each other and lifting them up and, and, and doing wonderful things for each other. But whenever you mentioned somehow getting to know the people across the street, oh no, you heard these words. We've never done it that way before. They're supposed to come to us. What do you mean us go to them? And so we did little things. I gathered a few people who, who thought it might be a good idea or at least decided to give it a chance. And we did, we did just little things. We had a beautiful porch on the back of our sanctuary. The kind of, it was a kind of a mission-style church. And we had a big portico outside of the sanctuary, outside of the narthex, outside of the, the doors that would be, you know, in this church right there. Had this real pretty porch. And we set up trick-or-treating one day on Halloween. We counted, we had 150 kids just come by trick-or-treating. And they were good kids. They were the same kids that you always heard terrible things about in the church. And then all of a sudden, but they loved coming, saying hi. They were good kids. Some of them came from rough situations, but they, they had fun and they were glad to have a place where they could trick-or-treat a little bit. Then we began to go to the community art walk. Every Friday... Every other Friday during the summer, we would build connections, build friends. We set up a booth. It was, we had a little mission that we decided to contribute to, and that became our little art walk booth. And we, we sold little trinkets that were made in Africa by a mission there, and we would sell them uh, at our booth. And it was a wonderful way to, to build those connections and build those friends and just to get out a little bit. Because you've heard me say this before, Jesus never held up a sign and said, if you want to get to know me, come meet me at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I'll be at this address, right? Jesus never did that, right? Jesus went to people. And so we were trying to find ways to do that. But there was that voice behind me and around me, but we've never done it that way before. And we find ourselves similarly in a changing world. We've never done church the way that we're doing it now. 50 years ago, you did not think, I imagine, that you would be doing a Bible study through a computer screen on Zoom. Nobody thought about that. Nobody thought about all the different ways that we're trying to, to speak Jesus into life situations that many of us never knew existed years ago. And we have two choices when new things and weird stuff pop up. We can lean into it and find it as a, as a challenge to, or, 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 or an opportunity to learn something. Or we can pull away. And that's what this little church had done. And slowly and slowly, as their friends passed away or moved away, they were just slowly shrinking and shrinking. Somehow, God is working in a changing world. And we've got to believe that if we want to stay on the positive end of the change. 
psychologists and social scientists have, have done like 75-year surveys of kind of of people as they go, the American Values Survey. And it's really, really interesting when you ask people what was, like if there ever was a utopian period of existence, when was it? You know, in, in our country, in your community, in the world. And, you know, most of us do think of that as like the 1950s, unless you're African American, they probably don't think of it as the 1950s. And that they've discovered that you and I think of the ideal period in the world as the time when we were 11 years old. Whenever that was, when you were 11 years old, the world was perfect, right? Think back to when you think of the good old days. That probably was when you were 11 years old. 1992 was awesome for me. Some of you were like, what? But when you were 11, right, those were the good old days. And the trouble is that when you look into it, the world was full of the same troubles, well, different troubles, but still troubles that there were now. The world was still the world. People were still people. We may have been on the positive side of change back then because we were young and still learning. And then later on, we got on the negative side of it and began to be hurt by some change, and, and we began to react a lot differently. But we can't lose our sight of the fact that no matter what, God is still working, bringing repentance and transformation. Often there's backlash when we try something new, like there was in Peter's day. And a lot of times we fail when we try something new. But if we believe that our God is the God of new life, then we won't be afraid to fail. Because you know what? God still got it. We'll just try again another way. Try again to do something else. Try again to, to help our community see the love and grace of God. And so when God shows us that God is moving, will we remain stuck? That was really the question in Peter's time. He couldn't explain it, but he, he knew that somehow God had done something incredibly unexpected. He knew that God had worked in a way that he never pictured God working before. He told Peter in that vision, rise up, kill and eat these things that the Torah says not to eat. And then God follows it up with don't call anything profane that I have called clean. And often the tradition followed looks different than we ever expected. Often, God moves and it changes the way we look at the world. But that's what a Christian life is all about. That's what Jesus should be doing all the time. Changing the way that we look at the world. Changing the way that, that we see the world around us. And that's how we Christians become people that are a little bit weird. Because when the world goes off on this tangent, we just stay steady. We don't become overcome with bitterness and with anger and with regret. Instead, we know that our life and our very soul is connected to the God of the universe. And God has brought our people through bad times and hard times and strange times. And God will do it again. Because baptism and the Holy Spirit can often look a little unpredictable. God often tries to keep us on our toes, I think. Because he knows that when we're invited into a relationship with Christ and when we accept that relationship, there's never a boring moment. We aren't supposed to be baptized into a life where we get settled into our routines and, and everything is predictable. No, God transforming the world that we become a part of is work. It's hard work. It's difficult work. It's strange work to everybody else. And it means that we go against a lot of the currents in our society. And so let us never be people that say, but we've never done it that way before. Thankfully, though, the Jerusalem Council did not say this. Thankfully, the Jerusalem Council decided that somehow this was a way that God was moving, and they should meet that with moving too. They should follow the Holy Spirit, even into uncomfortable territory. 
And so how can we do that today? How can we follow God into uncomfortable territory today? How can we as a church follow God into a changing world? How can we, as people of God, look out and see all the different people there are and still somehow see that God loves them just as much as God loves us? That's our challenge, and that was Peter's challenge and the Jerusalem church's challenge. And I want to point out, if the Jerusalem church had told him, no, we've never done it that way before, I don't think there's a person sitting here that would be sitting here. Because none of you have told me you have Jewish ancestry, but all of you are probably non-Jewish ancestry, which means you're all Gentiles. You're all like Cornelius. We're all like Cornelius. And somewhere along the line, Peter decided, hey, going to Gentiles is okay. And that may seem like a switch that that we don't even think about, but that was the first big challenge that the early church met. And that really paved the way for all of the other things in in the future. We haven't always done it right. There are times we've made terrible mistakes as a church and as churches. But God is always guiding us forward. And as the world changes, God's love doesn't. And so we have to find ways to meet those new people and those new challenges with the same love of God that has always been there before. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for meeting us in our different world. You aren't any more absent than you were that day that Cornelius came to know you as his Lord and Savior. You aren't any different that day that Jesus came to us and said, Peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Lord, help us, no matter what the situation may look outside, no matter what the culture may look outside, to be people of peace, people who proclaim your love to a world that is starving for it. Help us to be people who see opportunity when the world throws us challenge. Help us to be people who see an opportunity to love and serve you even deeper when the world throws us something different. And Lord, as we share Holy Communion here in a moment, help us be people that see grace everywhere we go. Amen. As a United Methodist Church, we believe that Holy Communion, just like God's grace, is best when it is shared with others. We don't believe there's any benefit in keeping anyone from the table, and so we consider the Lord's table open to all who come for Holy Communion. Coming forward symbolizes our own approach to the table of the Lord, and as unworthy as we are, we receive the gift of grace in the bread and the wine. You're invited to open your hymnals to page 12 and participate in the liturgy today. And on page 12, you'll find the confession and pardon. This is an opportunity for us to confess our sins before God and each other, knowing that there is still grace here and that God still uh, extends to us and allows us, extends to us grace and allows us to approach his table. So let us prepare our hearts to receive God's grace, knowing that the favor God shows us is not earned, but is given as a gift. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who sincerely repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Let us confess our sin before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us pray together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, pure, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night that he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ broken for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks again and he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the blood of Christ shed for us. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and in your holy church, all honor, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. You join me in our prayer after receiving. It's on page 11 of your hymnals. This prayer helps us to prepare our heart to take the sacrifice of Christ and the the grace of Christ out into the world around us. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is number 733, Marching to Zion. Would you please stand in body or in spirit? We're going to sing all the verses, partly because I love this hymn. So if we don't sing it with enough gusto, I'll have us retry. Because you can't sing this song half asleep. So do you have a train horn on that thing? Okay, all right. 733, Marching to Zion.
God, out of God's great love, has created you. Jesus Christ, out of his great love, has redeemed you. And the Holy Spirit, out of that same great love, has lifted up and inspired you to go out in peace and service throughout God's world, proclaiming the good news of peace, love, hope, and joy to all. Yes, even Roman centurions. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.